Okay, let's bow our heads again for a blessing that we can ask upon our, our lives and those about us. Our dear Heavenly Father, our Elder Brother and the Holy Spirit, as we come humbly before Thee, we ask this time not only for ourselves but for others. We think of the young people, especially those in middle school and in high school, those in their formative years when they're seeking their way along. We know that so many of them are growing up and in a, in a very difficult situation and one of the things that they have to work against all the time is the advertisements that are trying to get them to take the products which are going to make them unhealthy. And so we pray that as we see these young people that we will somehow be a, a, an inspiration to them, an example to them, and help them to realize that we love them enough to Try to help them through this difficult time so that they can have improved health. We thank you in your holy name. Amen. As you can see, it says to prevent, to survive, reverse it for life. How many of you have seen the word before? Diabesity. Is there such a word? <laughs> It's a marriage of two words, isn't it? Diabesity. And we see that 67% of Americans are overweight. Actually, this is probably uh, a magazine that's about 10 years old that we got, and the number is higher now, unfortunately. 40% of Americans do not have diabetes, but they have pre-diabetes and the number keeps going up when I first came here 25 years ago we said that probably 8 to 10 million people had diabetes now we're talking more like 14 to 18 million people to have diabetes and the ones that have pre-diabetes 40% of American adults and the thing that's really so serious and so important for us to know is that the young people, what we call metabolic syndrome. What is metabolic syndrome? Well, that's what we're going to look at. But metabolic syndrome, we didn't even know what it was probably 30 years ago. They started looking at it and they said, there's something going on here. And it's doing all these kind of things to destroy our health. And finally, they looked at all the things that were happening. And they said, that's not syndrome X. We've got a name for it now. It's the metabolic syndrome. And that's the way your body is using the energy that you put into it. And you'll see when we talk about the handouts, and we'll, we'll look at these briefly, and then we'll... And we'll talk about them specifically. 80% of those with type 2 diabetes are overweight or obese. Now we're talking about not only adults now, but since this, was, since this magazine came out, we're talking about middle school and high school students. And you'll see what we're talking about as we go into this. Now... What I want us to look at is the metabolic syndrome. We started out calling it syndrome X. That's what we usually do when we find something that's there. We just label it X because we don't know enough about it. But at least it's, we're talking about it. It's something. And now we know a lot about it, but we need to know more. And people need to be educated more. So during the summer vacation, Kids with a body mass index, it grows more than twice as fast as during the school year, says a recent study. It says the source is the American Journal of Public Health. Now, if you look at this, this uh, 
I was going to say young man. He almost looks like a man, doesn't he? Because we're not used to seeing children this big. But he's probably, he's probably in 7th uh, or 8th grade. That's our middle school years. And you see that he has uh, things that he's eating there. Uh, there's popcorn. There's chips. I'm not sure what's in the bowl there. There's some kind of a, of a, uh, a snack food there. Now, it could be including other things, and it should be including other things. He might be washing these down with what? Soda. With soda pop. Do you, know that our, do you know that our middle school and high school students are getting 20% of their calories? 20% of their calories are coming from soda pop. There's five factors that are involved. When I was down in Belize, I used this slide to show to the people. Two of them, you don't even have to have a blood test. If you measure your girth, and it's a man, if it's 40 inches, then you've got one of the five. If you have high blood pressure, you can put a cuff on your arm and you can do this many places. By the way, as a caveat, don't do that in a drugstore or something. Those can be as much as 30% off. You need a real, actual, if it's a, a nurse or somebody that has a proper one and they can test it. Now, one high blood pressure reading doesn't mean that you have high blood pressure. But if you keep getting them, and it's not like 180 over 100, even if it's 135 or more. And we'll talk about that when we talk about hypertension. That's a little bit elevated. So it's a blood pressure that's going towards the high side. Also high fats in the blood, and we would call that triglycerides. And the triglycerides are the ones that are the most important in the metabolic syndrome. Okay, and then high cholesterol, but what we're looking at here is actually a low HDL. And you saw that when you got your blood work back today. You saw that the low HDL was the, the HDL stands for the healthy. You can just remember healthy. If you try to remember both of them, is it what was, what was, just remember one. Or if you're a pessimist, just remember L is lousy. Okay. If you're an optimist, remember healthy. You want that higher. And the higher it is, the better. Okay. And then starting to have sweet blood. What does that mean? Well, well it's, it's elevated blood sugar. And that's what the people down in Central America call it. They said, oh, she has sweet blood or he has sweet blood. Now, people are not used to having children have this, are they? What did we call type 2 diabetes in the early days? Type 2 diabetes was known as adult onset, or maturity onset, or late onset. What does that conjure up in your mind? People that are 30 or 40 or 50 years of age, right? No, no, no. No, <laughs> no adults. When, when are we an adult? Anyway, well, you, you know what I'm trying to talk about. Now we've got to talk about our, our children that are in 7th, 8th. We, sometimes it's called, it used to be called junior high. Uh, 8, 9, and 10, 7, 8, and 9. Anyway, you've got the idea. Now we're calling it the middle school and we're calling it high school. I, I've read an article recently and the, and the person in the article said, you know, it's really not a big thing in, in young people. Probably there's less than than 
uh, five or 10,000 people in the United States that are having the metabolic syndrome when they're young, when they're children. Now let me tell you about my classmate if that's a, sta a true statement. She stayed down at Loma Linda University and she's one of the professors down there. She's been there since she finished her residency and that was in the, in the later, the middle to the later uh, 70s. Now she has a, uh, Loma Linda has a freeway and then across the freeway there's a town called San Bernardino. Some of you that are in Southern California, you know about it. Loma Linda University is in that area. What we know about San Bernardino is that there's a lot of Hispanics. And Hispanic people have more diabetes than some of the other groups. The ones that are the highest are the Native Americans that are in the Navajo Nation. And they have a very, very high percent of those that are that are diabetic. Now, when I went down to Southern California one time for one of our class reunions, my classmate said, you know, I, I've heard about what you folks do up there at Weimar. And she said, I wish that I could do that for my patients because I have 200 type 2 diabetics. What's the rest of the story? She is a pediatrician. That means none of her diabetics have reached 18 years of age. So I don't know what that article is talking about. Maybe it's talking about five and 10 year olds. But she has, she has 200 uh, type two diabetics that are under 18 years of age. So this is a big, big problem. Now, if we look at this, you only have to have three of those to qualify for the metabolic syndrome. So you go in, well, I, I, I'm sure that, that my classmate uh, doesn't have children, a lot of children that have, uh, a, a lot of the male children that have a 40 inch waist. They don't have to have that much. But when we, we're talking about adults, a 40 inch waist, so you can measure your waist. You can get your blood pressure checked. If your blood pressure is too high and, and, and you're, uh, you're, you're not in the uh, older age group, and like I said before, if it's going up to 135 or above, then that's, you're on your way to having high blood pressure. Now, how does a person know about those other ones? How does a person determine that they have diabetes? Now, people are more alert. They're more cognizant of this. They're more wondering if they're in that category. But you know, most people, this may be an old statistic, but most people have had diabetes for five years or more by the time they find out that they're diabetic. What is the first symptom that some people have? They find out that they have pain in their feet. They're kind of going numb. They're tingling sometimes. Maybe it's the feet and the hands. And they say, you know, I, I have this strange feeling. I've never had that in my feet before. So they go see the doctor when it gets annoying. It can be something more. What would that be? They see that when they're driving down the freeway, they used to be able to see the signs far enough down the freeway, but now they're almost, they're almost on the signs and they can't react anymore because they, they've missed their exit. Or they're in the supermarket and they used to be able to see, you know, it has, it has what the items are on that aisle and they used to be able to look up and they could see what they were. In fact, they could see the ones that were on the second board down on the aisle and they and now they they have a hard time even reading the ones that are on the ones that are near to them and so they realize that their eyesight isn't very good so they go and see 
they go see the ophthalmologist or the optometrist and they say you know my eyes are not too good now the optometrist might look in and see that they already have retinal damage but if the optometrist is wondering about it they might say you know I'm worried about your blood sugar what makes it so that they and they hopefully they won't give them glasses what what what's the problem with the vision when you have high blood sugar your lens starts to swell and it tends to make it so that you can't see things that are further away so they might get it under control and you say you know my vision is getting better now and and it's not because you have the retinopathy but it's because of the swelling in the lens because you have too high of a blood sugar those are two one of the reasons why people find out that they have diabetes especially if they have a, a hard floor in the bathroom or a linoleum or something like that the the uh, wife goes in or the or the or the husband goes in and he notices that when he's standing there when she's sitting there she notices that the floor is sticky you know we we men are not good shots all the time and we might miss and if there's sugar in our urine you go in there and you find out that the floor is sticky around the toilet and you say I don't know what's happening here that you're already starting to spill some sugar in your urine so these are the things another thing is, is the person might find out that they have coronary artery disease because they're having angina and that's one of the things that's going to plug up your arteries the fastest is diabetes so there's a lot of different things it gives us but every person should go in at least once a year and have their annual blood draw like you've got now and look at those things those are screening tests that you had today and and they're not the last part if we see something's wrong we'll go further and we'll look further but you also now that you're vegan you really truly need to have your vitamin b12 checks because if you don't do that there's five things that can destroy your health when your vitamin b12 level gets low and i'll say this parenthetically i'll say it right now you should have a vitamin b12 level that's at least 500 650 is better for a senior okay and people say well what should i take you should take 500 okay you can get the little tablets you put one in your mouth after you eat when you go for your walk after you eat 500 in your mouth and your blood sugar i mean and your blood level should be 500 you don't have to know the units now what happens in may when we have a big race in the united states and we used to talk about it all the time and it's still a big deal what is that called it's called the indianapolis 500 so just remember the indianapolis 500 you take your 500 your blood level should be at least 500 and you're off to the races can you remember it that way okay every vegan needs to have a vitamin b12 supplementation we can't say more about that right now we have to hurry on okay when fat attacks how fat cells are waging war on your health and why dieting is no magic bullet what does that mean now you have this little chart here and we're going to look a little further here now that looks like a terribly busy chart doesn't it look at your chart and see if you can identify what i'm talking about now this is a fat cell okay and this is triglyceride that's a fat droplet and these the fat cells have fat in them fat droplets in them now the thing that's the most important about this and we'll go over it in more detail but right now you see that a man tends to have an apple shape why does a man have an apple shape 
because he gains his weight more around the middle. What does the woman have a, as a shape? She's supposed to have more of what they call a pear shape. Now this only lasts during the years when the woman is in her childbearing years. Why is it that she has the pear shape? Because she's storing her fat on the buttocks and thighs, on her arms, and on her breast. Why is that important? Not too much of it, I must say, but why is it important? You see, when a woman is pregnant, that's where she's putting on weight, isn't it? And when she's nursing a baby, and that's why it's so important that if a mother can nurse a baby for at least six months, I know that uh, most of the time you get maternity leave and it's usually for only six weeks, but that's going to make the best baby. It's going to help the mother to lose that weight that she got during pregnancy, and it's going to help her have the best health and the baby the best health. And we can't go into that. We'll talk more about that when we talk about Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so now when the woman is no longer in her menstrual cycles and she's not in her childbearing age, and that's around 50. Very parenthetically though, if a woman is smoking, she's probably going to stop her menstruations when she's 40 and she's going to start the downhill slope at 40 instead of 50. Now, I don't want to discourage anybody because the downhill slope doesn't have to be until you, uh, Dr. Campbell, we cornered him one time and we said, if people live like the Chinese did in your study, way up there where they're exercising and they're eating all the foods that they grow, how long should a person live? And he said, that's not a fair question. And we said, well, give us your best hunch. He said, well, don't quote me. But Americans, with all the health care dollars they spend, if they would live like the Chinese, eat like the Chinese, exercise like the Chinese, do the work that the Chinese live, they should all live healthfully into their 90s. Not just exist into their 90s, they should live healthfully in their 90s. And that's another thing. People should not be getting Alzheimer's disease. We know enough about it now so that that should not be one of the things that we have. Now, that's not a, that, we're, we're beginning to find that out. And that's another thing, that's a, a little sidebar, but I can't re help resist saying that. Okay, here's the things, we won't go for these, but it has to do with your immune system. Interleukin-6, tumor necrosing factor alpha, there's the fatty acids, there's the triglycerides. Here we have the clotting mechanisms. Here we have the, the mechanisms that causes high blood pressure. These are very important things. Over here we have the cholesterol, the, the cortisol levels. These are very important when it comes to diabetes. And here we have adiponectin and we have resistin. Adiponectin and resistin. As the name implies, resistance contributes to, re to insulin resistance. And we get up high enough, we find out that this starts to work against us, and we have insulin resistance. The cells don't want any more, any more uh, fuel going into them. They don't want any more sugar, and they don't want any more fat. Now up there at the top, but you can see that on yours, there's something called leptin. Leptin, as we, as we get fatter, leptin is supposed to help us so that we can control our appetite. So they said, aha, if leptin helps us to control our appetite, let's synthesize some of it. Let's get a bunch of it and let's give it to people. But they found out that the people that were overweight, somehow they were not sensitive to it anymore. And so leptin, they thought that was going to be the miracle uh, substance that they could give, but it doesn't work on people that are overweight. It doesn't work well. So this is the, this is the, the chart, and this is what 
we saw here when fat attacks and there's a fat cell the fat cells are waging war on your health and dieting is no bullet magic bullet and we're going to look at that in just a minute okay this is the problem this is a man and this man truly has a big girth you can see that but what you see inside these are his intestines that's his stomach there's his pancreas and that's his liver that is a very sick liver and they can even pick this up on ultrasound and they can say you have fatty infiltration in your liver how many of you have heard of fatty infiltration in the liver okay it's a very very important thing this is the metabolic syndrome that has already worked on this individual and here's the important part it's the intra-abdominal fat and it's a fat infiltration into the liver right there that is metabolic syndrome and that's what we just looked at and when you have that all of those things are happening to destroy your health and many more okay now here's a man he's got this fat on his back he certainly has a lot of fat out front what if they were to remove that fat what would happen to the metabolic syndrome absolutely nothing because it's what's inside that's making him sick now wouldn't you like to know how to avoid this and that's what we're going to look at right now this time it's not fat in the diet what is it this time it's refined carbohydrates okay now as we go back what is this right here triglycerides fat droplets now we're looking at these cells these are cells that are inside the abdomen and that's what's making the fat around the organs and the fat in the liver does everybody have that concept that's the most important thing that you can understand about metabolic syndrome is those triglycerides and they come from eating refined carbohydrates okay now we may have to look at that does everyone know what a triglyceride is okay well I think we better take a break here now for that table sugar has a molecule can you all see that a molecule of glucose and it also has a molecule this one looks like a little birdhouse okay fructose what is fructose fructose is the fruit sugar okay now you've heard of high fructose corn syrup okay really they've made a big deal about that because high fructose that's this one here corn syrup is only 10% different from table sugar so if they were to use cane sugar to make the soda pop it really wouldn't make that much difference but high fructose corn syrup is cheaper because we've got lots and lots of corn around and we can get a lot of sugar out of corn but really don't get don't get uh, really uh, concerned or overly concerned about high fructose corn syrup both of these are refined carbohydrate 
and starches too. Straight starches. Now, why is the fructose such an important thing? Because when fructose is, is uh, metabolized, we come out with a three carbon set up like that and that's glycerol okay and then we have the fatty acids now have I lost you if we have the fatty acids here they can be four carbons long the ones that we normally eat from plant sources are 18 carbons long the ones that we eat from the animal sources <coughs> excuse me the ones that we eat from the animal sources are 20 carbons long. And when we see about, when we look at hypertension, we're going to see that they make entirely different substances. And we can't go into that. But these fatty acids are whatever, si uh, whatever size they are. Now this would be a monosaccharide. I mean, I mean a monoglyceride. Now if we put another fatty acid on it, that is a diglyceride. Now if we, if we saturate it so that there's no more docking sites, we call that a triglyceride. Does that make sense to you now? That's the way we carry our fat in our body. It's a very, very important concept. So, when we eat a lot of fructose, which is in both of these, we have a lot of these, these uh, <clears throat> docking sites for the fatty acids, and that's how we increase our, our triglycerides. We ha I had a patient that came in, and her tri she had problems with the fats in her blood. But one of the things that was a... A big problem for her is that when she stopped the fats, she started eating <clears throat> a lot of dried fruit. And I couldn't figure out, I think that <clears throat> her triglycerides were about 200, plus minus, <clears throat> excuse me. And when she came in the next time and we checked her, her triglycerides were 450. And I, I started asking her all kinds of things about sugar and so forth. And she said, no, I'm eating whole plant foods. Okay, well, it took me a while, but then I said, well, uh, what about syrups? And I went through everything. No, no, no. And then I thought, you know, I wonder if she is eating a lot of, of dried fruit. Because when we eat dried fruit, you know, we, we tend to eat a lot more. Say you came in and you were really hungry. And uh, say there was a, a, a bowl of nuts there. And then there was a bowl of pear halves or something like that. And so you took some, a handful of nuts. And how many pear halves could you eat when you're hungry? You might eat six or eight. Or if you're really hungry, more. That is a lot of concentrated fructose. And so she said, you know, I've learned how to make these killer cookies. She said it's almost all dried fruit. And the kids, when they come in, the grandkids, they just wipe me out on those. They're so tasty. And I said, oh, dear, <laughs> what are we going to do now? Because you're eating too much concentrated fructose in your dried fruit. So that's just one of the, one of the things that uh, is, is something that we need to think about. Whole plant fruit. Whole, whole plant food and the fruit probably fresh is it's probably safer to eat it that way but you can have the other but eat about the same amount as you would as if you're eating the whole as you're eating the whole fresh okay we have to hurry along but as this continues to go into fatty infiltration eventually it's going to go into cirrhosis completely into cirrhosis why? What do we usually think of cirrhosis? We think of an alcohol. But you know, when we eat a lot of refined carbohydrate, 
when it is being digested and fermented, then it turns into an alcohol as well. And so that's the problem that we've got with that. And so this is the most important thing that you can know about metabolic syndrome. This lady is my hero. And, and we'll look at the handouts there. Catherine Tucker from Tufts University. And she found out the refined carbohydrates increase the intra-abdominal visceral fat. These enlarged fat cells have powerful health-destroying force. Okay? Whole plant foods, whole grains, beans, fruits, and vegetables will not do this even if, now get this, the total calorie intake is comparable and the weight stays the same. Isn't that incredible? And I'm going to show you on your handout how you can have that and how you can uh, uh, show other people about this. So here's some of the sources of our uh, refined carbohydrates. That's the very short, short list. And these are stored inside the abdomen. Okay, now if 20% of the calories are coming from, from uh, soda pop, look at that uh, two liter there. Look at how many cubes of sugar that are in there. And then there's the, uh, the smaller bottle. A lot of people will drink that, won't they? And then there's the can. What is, what is the biggest drink that you can get normally when you go into like AM and PM or one of these other places? What do they call it? The big tanker or the big gulp. And what are we getting? 66 ounces. 66 ounces of a sugary drink. And then the, the problem is, is that the caffeinated drinks dehydrate you because they... They take more of the water out, and so that, that's another problem. Okay, let's hurry on. What about the fruit juice? You know, people that are in, that, that are really in the know and they're trying to help their kids to stay healthy, you know what they do? They go to the school and they take out all of those fast food things. They take out the, the, uh, the soda machines and they even take out the fruit drinks. Why? Because look at how much sugar there is in that. Okay, now there's the whole fruit. You see, that's kind of protected, isn't it? Do you know that if you were to, to drink an 8-ounce glass, well, it depends on the sugar content, but if you were to drink a, a, a fairly large glass of uh, 8 or 10 ounces of Apple juice, you would be getting 25 teaspoons of sugar when you drank that. that. That's a lot of refined. So try to make your beverage, try to make the beverage that you take, try to make that uh, water. That's the only thing that truly hydrates you. Okay, now there's the vegetable. One serving... of carrot. But that's eaten whole, isn't it? I know people that go on the carrot diet and they'll take 10 or 20 pounds of carrots and make them into juice. They're getting a lot of sugar when they do that because carrot juice is sweet, isn't it? So try to eat the things whole. Remember, whole plant foods eaten whole. Now there's the corn. Now what about, what about our... Uh, uh, cereals. Probably the healthiest, healthiest cereal that you could eat would be the, uh, the shredded wheat bits. You know, the shredded wheat used to come in the big ones, but now you can find the little ones. And that's what we want our diabetics to eat uh, if they have low blood sugar. Carry the, the uh, shredded wheat uh, spoon-sized bits and some raisins. And what, what, what you want to do is if you're getting a low blood sugar, Take about this much in the palm of your hand, put them in your mouth, and chew them and chew them and chew them until they just run down the back of your throat. That's going to give you sugar just right away, starting in your mouth and going down. And that'll raise your blood sugar so that you won't go into, a, into an insulin shock. And then what you want to do 
after it's come up a little bit, take one of those shredded wheat and, and, and a raisin and put that in your mouth and keep chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing. And then what happens? That'll carry your blood sugar probably four or five hours. I know people pop the glucose tablets and 20 minutes later they have to pop another one or they have to go and eat something. But if you do that, carry that as your emergency ration. So, and then Cheerios isn't bad. It's kind of an expensive way to eat oats, but you see there's not a lot of sugar in that. And so the best way is to eat the whole plant foods whole. Okay, now as we look at that, what about some of the ones that the children are really interested in now? What about Fruit Loops? What about, do they still make Count Chocula and Frankenberry, or is, is that, is that old-fashioned stuff? I haven't seen that for a while. But anyway, and then there's Trix, is it? All of these, all of these cereals that the kids really like are just loaded with sugar. It's really, really sad. So, if you can, try to get them to eat the more nutritious ones. So whole plant foods eaten whole. There are the grains, some of them. There are the beans. What is this? We have to hurry now. Those are all different types of soybeans around the world. There's 7,000 different varieties of soybeans. Isn't that incredible? And there's many, many different types of legumes all around the world. I've eaten some in Africa that you folks have never even heard of. And then Asia has their own, their own beans and so forth. So get a crock pot, cook your beans slowly, six to eight hours, put onions and, and, uh, and garlic in them if you like that. Get another crock pot for your grains and you'll get the very greatest, best flavors from those. Okay, now here's something that's very important. Stop meat, stop insulin. Whoops, then you've got another one there. Look at your handout now, because that's right here. This one stopped meat, stopped glyburide, stopped meat, and stopped insulin. Why is this important? Why, what's wrong with the meat? Well, it puts the body into a breakdown situation. And read this right here. It's from, from Dr. Stephen Provencia. He worked with Kaiser. In the first line it says, when an organism is starving, infected or injured, the body initiates a catabolic response that among other things creates insulin resistance. Now, there's a lot of people that are doing this very same thing that, that, you, that you folks have heard about now. And we'll look at that in just a minute. But that's really incredible. So stop eating the meat and put this along with the whole plant foods whole. And that's the reason why I believe that we have so much success with that. Now people are always thinking of diets. Do you have a diet apple? Well, no, di apples, are, <laughs> apples are good in of themselves. So fortunately, this is Dr. Samuel Klein, Washington University in St. Louis. Fortunately, abdominal fat disappears first when the person has a good regular exercise program. And that's the take home message. That's the take home message from, from this lecture. So there it is, can this be reversed? Yes, when it's fatty infiltration, then as the person exercises, it's going down, and when a person continues to exercise, they can get into a normal weight, and that can be completely reversed without going on through to, to uh, cirrhosis. We have had women, and I don't, I don't suggest that everybody does this, but we have had women that have come in to our program. They weren't grossly overweight, but they did have some of the weight in places they weren't supposed to. They had fatty infiltration of the liver. They had the metabolic syndrome. They had diabetes type 2. And they were, when they found this out, in fact, one of the times I gave this lecture, the people came and they said, what did you tell them last night? 
last night after your lecture, people were just going up and down, up and down, up and down in the hall. I said, right, they got the message. <laughs> and so it's reversible when we do that. Now this is the one that I told you about on the first night. This is the unhappy camper. His name was Ron Hargan, remember? You have a picture of him. This is what he looked like. He, he, he labeled himself as the unhappy camper. And uh, he really truly was unhappy and he had all these problems. And then that's what he looked like when he went in 18 months later. You know what he found out is, he, found, he surmised, he thought that what they were trying to do is find out if they should, they hadn't seen him, if they should transfer his file into the deceased area. And that didn't really make him feel good. But this really made him feel good when he ran in there and showed him his, uh, the way he was doing and they wanted to know, how did you get that way? They didn't recognize him, of course. I just don't have the willpower to stay on a diet. Another example of the weak inheriting the girth. <laughs> now here's something that's very important. There's three things wrong with this problem, with this picture here, okay? What is it? First of all, probably this lady did not eat a breakfast that was, did they tell you about eating breakfast like a king? She probably didn't have an adequate breakfast. Number two, and we'll talk about this when we talk about temperance, she should not be going down that street. <laughs> she should avoid that street. And number three, and this is the one that's the most important of all, she really needs to know that it really makes a great deal of difference to somebody if she's healthy or not, and if she's having a good life. And if you don't know anybody that you can point to, you have an elder brother and he's pleading for you in heaven that you'll be successful. Okay, now, what I want us to look at is these handouts. This talks about visceral fat. It talks about Dr. Klein saying, fortunately, a good exercise program will get rid of that visceral fat first. So this is the lady beside the refrigerator. This is the other one. I want you to put this on the refrigerator, okay? Side by side. And people come in and they look at your refrigerator, don't they? And when they look at this, they'll say, what in the world is this picture with all these funny things on it? And then you can say, well, this is the reason why I don't have to take my medicines for diabetes anymore. This is the reason why I'm starting to look the way I do. This is the reason why I'm healthy. Now say, well, tell me about it. You say, well, you can read it, and next time you come, we'll talk about it more. Don't overload them, okay? When they see it again, especially as you're doing wonderfully well, they're going to say, wow. Okay, on the back of it, you can see this again, and you might have to be able to take it off your refrigerator and share that. Now, the other one is very important, and I don't see it up here with mine. Let me quickly get one. It's the one that has the... Uh, yeah. It's the one that you've got there on your lap. Okay. This, on the back side, it talks about peripheral neuropathy or diabetic neuropathy. Generally, it's in the feet. And that's the reason why some people come in and they find out they have diabetes. We did this study here, and you cannot imagine how gratifying, how wonderful, uh, how much it cause, causes the person to be happy and filled with joy when this horrible pain in their feet starts to get better, even in the 18 days that they're here. And, and we've done this, and the longer a person's on it, the better it is for them. Now, to show you on the back side here, we're not the only ones that are doing this. This is from the University of Virginia. You can see the site down there. And you read the highlighted parts. And he says, so often what we do, and I'm going to read it for, for you here so that we can get that on this. On this uh, let 
on this talk. Here at the bottom it says the theory the clinic is based on. Does everybody have it? It's right here. You can put this on your refrigerator too if people say, oh, well, that's just that place you went to. We'll say, there's other people that do this. The theory the clinic is based on is that diabetes is a protective mechanism to shield the patient's body from having too much energy or too much fat, you could say, or too much sugar. Thorner says, all of the standard treatments for diabetes, including insulin shot, enhances the patient's ability to store excess fat, okay? Which is, in the long run, which will be more harmful to the diabetic patient. That's a very, very important concept and a very, very important statement. So I have this one on your refrigerator too, if you know people that are diabetic and they come over and visit sometimes. And they want to know what you're doing. Okay, as far as I know, I haven't heard, in closing, I have not heard this talked about in the magazines. My family practice or any of the other journals, New England Journal of Medicine, I don't think that this has gotten out and I think this is another reason why we're very, very successful. And that is when you stop meat, your, your sugar comes into, into control. And that catabolic syndrome where the body is tearing itself down because of, what does it say? Starvation, infection, or injury. And so you eat the injured animal, you eat the meat, and that causes the catabolic syndrome and it makes it so that your insulin doesn't work as well. So this is the very important part. If I had time, I could tell you, well, I'll say it very briefly. There was a lady that when she found out she was having diabetes, she said, I'll do all of that stuff but, that you're talking about, but I will not stop eating meat. Her sugars for eight years were never under 350. And when she, she was on four or five different things for her diabetes, and when she stopped eating the meat and she started doing the exercise, I think she was one of the ones that ate, that lost three inches in her waist. And when she left, her sugars were coming down into the 200s and she was off of all of her diabetic medication. And we followed her and the people where she works are just totally amazed because she's totally a different person now that her diabetes is under control and she's not on any of her medicines now for diabetes. Thank you, folks. I know that was a tremendous amount of stuff to cover and we'll probably be hitting it in other lectures if you have questions and anything, but this is the basis for that. You really truly need to eat your whole plant foods whole and not any, eat any of the refined carbohydrates or sugar because this is the reason why you're getting the metabolic syndrome and the fat inside the abdomen. This time it's not eating fat, it's eating refined carbohydrates. Thank you.